Hey everyone, Kevin P. McAuliffe here and I am back again with another Creative Cow tutorial and in our ongoing look at learning Avid's Media Composer and Symphony, I told you in the last lesson where we started talking about audio mixing that in this lesson we're going to talk about another valuable tool in that process and that is the audio tool. Now the audio tool is actually going to serve a few different purposes and there's some things in there that you're definitely going to need to know not only just for audio mixing but just for getting things set up in general when you're working even things like when you have to create bars and tone this is where you're actually going to find the tone media so i'm going to go through and show you how setting up something very simple like bars and tone if you don't know where everything is can be a little bit tricky okay short introduction in this lesson let's just get into symphony and let's get started Okay, now before I command tab in this case into Avid Symphony, you're going to recognize that I'm back again on the Mac. I want to make sure that I give equal love to both platforms, both Mac and Windows. So occasionally you'll see me switching back and forth. So obviously keep that in mind if I happen to get a few of the shortcuts backwards. Okay, so in this case, like I said, we're going to command tab into Symphony or obviously alt tab for all of my Windows friends out there. And the first thing I want to do is I'm going to come in here and I'm going to open a bin that I happen to have some audio in. So I'm going to navigate over to my other bins and here's a music bin. And this again is some music, some royalty free music from Rampant Design Tools. And I'm just going to call up one of the audio clips here. I'll just simply double click on it and you'll see the way it was imported. It was imported as two separate mono tracks that of course are joined together when I'm going to drop them into my timeline for a, a separate left and a separate right channel. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to navigate up here. I'm going to open my sequences bin. I'm just going to bring the sequences bin right actually down here. Now what's also important to keep in mind since we are working in the newest version of Symphony is that we can actually take these and make them a tabbed element here just like such. Makes life a lot easier. Especially when you don't have a lot of screen real estate like I don't have right now. Now for me, what I like to do is just make everything nice and organized here just like such. Very nice. We'll just stretch things down a little bit. And once I've got this the way I like it, I'm going to save this as my standard editing view. So we'll just bring this down like such. Perfect. I don't want it too close to the bottom because if I do, every time I hit the bottom, the dock is going to appear. So once I have this the way I like it, what I'm going to do is navigate up to Windows. I'm going to come to Workspaces and I'm just going to say Save Current. So it's going to save over the source and record editing. So I'll just say Save Current. So this way, if I move some stuff, you know, sort of stick it helter skelter here. As soon as I come back up to Windows and go back to Workspaces and say Source Record Editing, boom, everything snaps back to exactly where I want it to be. Okay, so I've got this audio called up again. Two uh, dual mono tracks to make up left and right. I'm simply going to hit T on the keyboard on both Mac and Windows, and I'm going to press B on both Mac and Windows. B as in Bob, or B I guess is in Overwrite Edit to edit this clip into my timeline. Now, of course, because I have multiple bins open, first thing Symphony is going to do is prompt me as to where do I want to put this clip. So I'm going to stick it into music. Actually, no, we're going to stick it into sequences. That's where we want it to go. I'll say OK. And I'm going to come back to the beginning here, and I'm simply going to hit play. So there is our music track. Now, one thing I do want to point out, and I don't know if I mentioned this before, is that if I'm going to click through frame by frame, now the number three at the top of your keyboard is going to move us back one frame. So I can go back one frame, and you'll see the time updating right here, one frame. Or the one key, obviously, at the top of the keyboard is going to go back ten frames. Now, on the flip side of that, the two key is going to move us ahead ten frames, and the four key is going to move us ahead one frame. So what we've got is one and two move us back ten frames and forward ten frames. And the 3 and 4 key are going to move us back one frame and forward one frame, respectively. Now, why am I mentioning this? Well, the reason I'm mentioning this is because I actually want to combine that with the Caps Lock key. As soon as I turn Caps Lock on, what's going to happen is, is that I'm going to move ahead one frame here, and you're going to hear that I've got some audio scrubbing happening. So this is not a menu function. I don't need to go into the menu anywhere and turn this on. As soon as you hit Caps Lock, it's going to give you audio scrubbing. And this is a great way to get in and do some audio editing, which we're going to talk about in an upcoming tutorial. Now, I dropped this into the timeline because I wanted to come back and play it. And you're going to notice as I play it, I've got some VU meters right here. And most people think that this is essentially how you're going to look at your mix with this very, very small uh, VU meter right here. Now, I don't particularly like to work with that. And in most cases, I actually don't even look at it when I'm working. What I actually like to do is call up the audio tool. Now, the audio tool can be accessed, again, many ways, as we all know, inside of Media Composer and Symphony. 
Obviously, one way to do it is because it is a tool, you can navigate up to Tools, and it's right here, Audio Tool. But of course, we want the all-important shortcut. Shortcut on the Mac, Command and 1, Control and 1, obviously, for all of my Windows friends out there. I'm just going to hit Control and 1. Now, this is a much nicer tool to look at. I'm just going to bring it right up here. I'm going to hit Play, and it gives us a much more... Uh, you know, sort of bigger in our face view. And we can also actually see in this view what uh, level our audio is at. So if the producer said, you know, we can't have this audio peaking any higher than minus, you know, 10, let's just say hypothetically, this is how we can get in and we can set that. Now, there are some other options inside the audio tool that I do want to talk about. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to navigate right up here and I'm just going to reset the peak here for one second. You're going to notice the peak has disappeared because the default, actually, I'm just going to switch things back to the default here just before I go in and talk about it. Uh, because now if I hit play, this is actually how things are going to be. Now let me just stop this a second. I want to get that digital scale out of the way here. I'll just play it. And what's going to happen is you'll see your view meters moving and as soon as you hit stop, everything disappears. Okay. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to navigate up to Peak Hold. I'm going to click on it. You're going to see now that the first two options I have are the input settings and the output settings. If I click on the input settings, basically I can now come in and set what the input source is. In this case, it's the built-in microphone. Uh, or I could come in and choose the M Fast Track Audio Pro, which is actually what I'm recording this tutorial through. Now, this, for the input source, is for if I wanted to record into MIDI Composer or Symphony, do a punch-in. And you can see that we can input monitoring during punch-in. Right now it's set to automatic. We can have it turned on or turned off. Now, if I come back to my audio tool, uh, the next option is actually the output settings. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to close the audio project settings, and you'll see again, if I come back to my settings here, it's actually right here inside the audio project. You'll see when I double-click on it, it defaults to the main view. But when I access it from the audio tool, I'm just brought right to the input settings. It just skips right over main. So you see, really, this is something that can all be dealt with when you're actually looking at your settings. You don't need to actually deal with any of this inside of the audio tool, except when we're talking about output. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to come to the output settings now. These output settings are going to vary depending on the hardware that you have installed on your machine. Because I'm recording this on an iMac, I don't have any hardware installed. So my default layout for audio is stereo, mono, and I even have two options for direct. I have surround tracks in Pro Tools order and surround tracks in SMPTE order. Now, the SMPTE order for uh, surround sound is normally an eight channel layout. You have left, right, center, sub, or as it's you know more commonly referred to as LFE. Then you have your left surround, right surround, stereo left, and stereo right to make up eight channels. So again, left, right, center, sub, left surround, right surround, stereo left, stereo right. Now, pretty much in every aspect of television and film production, this is the layout that you're going to have for surround sound. We're talking about SMPTE surround sound, so obviously keep that in mind. Now, what's also important to keep in mind is that in most cases, if you're going to be doing surround sound work, chances are you're going to be sending it to Pro Tools. And I'm going to talk about getting your timeline set up to send audio to Pro Tools in a later tutorial. Okay, so what I'm going to do is just close the audio project settings here. I'm going to come back up to my peak hold. I'm going to drop that down. And again, you're going to notice we just I just mentioned this. We we're talking about how the pH stands for peak hold. And you'll see peak hold is set right here. But we have two options, peak hold and infinite hold. And what's the difference between the two of them? Well, what I'm going to do is I'm just simply going to hit play here. And here's our audio playing. And you're going to see again, much like I said before, as soon as I hit stop, the VU meters, where the actual uh, loudest point of the audio is, disappears as soon as I hit stop. But what if I needed to know what the loudest part of the uh, music track is? Well, if I come back up to peak hold, I come down to infinite hold right here, and I select that. Now when I hit play, this is actually how things were set up at the beginning, and I switched it so you could see what the default settings were. But if the producer says to me, well, what's the loudest that this gets? What I can do is I can stop this right here, and you'll see if I come back to the audio tool, that I'm now being shown by the infinite hold what the loudest this track gets to. And you'll see I can tell them that it's actually minus 20 on a digital scale. Now, in most cases, I don't normally have that set because audio, in this case, you'll see it's pretty, pretty even. Like, it doesn't really get any higher than minus 20. So if I was to get in and raise or lower the volume of this track, I could probably say, well, if this is minus 20 right now, if I bump it up, let's just say 8 dB, I know that that's pretty much going to be at minus 12 right across the board, so I know I'm okay. 
Now again, we're going to get in and talk more about adjusting levels when we actually do a mix, which is coming up in the next couple of tutorials. But let's just talk about the couple other options we have up here. What I'm going to do is just navigate back up to the peak hold. I'm going to come down. I'm going to switch it back to peak hold here. And let's come back up. We're going to drop that down. You'll see the next option we have is just to simply play calibration tone. Everybody loves that old calibration tone here. And you'll see this is if you needed to set your deck up. I'm just going to stop that because that can be pretty annoying. Uh, what we could use that for is if we, let's just say, needed to make sure that we had a signal going out to a deck or anything like that, we can just play calibration tone. Then we can go and check, make sure either a camera or a deck is actually getting a signal from Media Composer or Symphony. Now I'm going to come back up to the peak hold drop down. You'll see I can also get in and I can calibrate as well, which is basically going to zoom in on my audio tool, what I can do now is come back up and I can say play calibration tone and I can see exactly where that calibration tone is on my VU meters. Again, I'm just going to stop that because that gets pretty loud inside my headphones here. Back up to the peak hold menu. Uh, what we're going to do is just turn calibrate off here for a second. Again, back up. You'll see we can also set our reference level. Now, right now, the reference level is set to minus 20. We could get in and set this to be whatever we wanted to. Let's just say hypothetically I wanted to set this to be, oh, I don't know, minus 10. I can just simply set it to be minus 10, and you'll see what we've got is the digital scale on the left, and we have the analog scale on the right. You'll see what zero now represents is minus 10 on the digital scale. So obviously something important to keep in mind. In most cases, I just leave that the way it was at minus 20 because pretty much with all the mixes I do, I'm always looking at the left side because now we're dealing in a digital world. So for me, that is what's most important. Now, the other thing that's important to keep in mind is that most people, for some reason, think that when they're mixing for television, they want the audio to be as loud as it can possibly be, as close to zero without distorting. Now, that is not the case when you're mixing for television. In most cases, you want to mix down around minus 10. You want minus 10 to be the loudest uh, sound that you're going to have. If your music, you know, ramps up at some point, minus 10 is as loud as you're going to want that to go. Okay, back up to the peak hold menu. I'm just simply going to drop that down. We can also set the calibration tone volume. You'll see right now it's set to be minus 20, and the tone frequency in hertz is set to be 1,000. If I wanted tone to be up at, you know, minus 8, minus 15, I can get in and punch it in right there, and we'll be all set to go. Now, last but certainly not least, I did mention about creating some tone. If we wanted to create some bars in tone, let's just say hypothetically we needed to have bars in tone before the slate in our show. Well, we can set that up very easily. What I'm going to do is I'm going to come back up to the peak hold menu. We're going to come down to create tone media. Media Composer is now going to say, well, okay, well, hold on. What do you want the tone media level to be in dB? What do you want the frequency to be? Most importantly, how long do you want it to be? How many tracks? And where do you want it to go to? Well, let's send it to sequences. I want it to be two tracks, and minus 20 is good, and I'll send it to the Jesse drive, which is fine. I'm simply going to say OK, and as soon as I do, if I come back to my bins and I come back to sequences, there's the tone ready to play back. But now here's the big question. Where do I find the color bars? Well, let me show you. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to right-click inside of sequences. I'm going to navigate to import. What we're going to do, and you'll see in this case, I've actually already navigated here before, but what you're going to do is you're going to come into the applications and you're going to go into the folder that holds your Symphony uh, application. You're going to want to go into supporting files, the supporting files folder. You're going to come all the way down to the bottom to test patterns, and inside here you'll see that you've got NTSC, PAL of both standard F, and then we've got 720PHD and 1080i slash 1080PHD. So what I'm going to do in this case, because I'm working in 720p, 2398, I'm simply going to select 720p HD. There's my SMPTE bars right there. Let's just make sure everything's set up. The image is sized for the current format. It's RGB. I'll just simply say ignore. We'll say OK. Now what I should have done here is I should have made that 60 seconds. I'm going to say OK. And let's import SMPTE bars here. I'll say go. You'll see in a second it's been imported, and now what I can do if I need it, let's just say I needed 10 seconds, what I'm going to do, mark an endpoint, I'll say plus 929. It's actually not 929, it's 923, because we're dealing in 720p here. You'll see there we go. Now let's just double check here that I am working in 720p, which I am. So let's just make sure here that we're dealing with 10 seconds even. There we go, perfect. What I'm going to do is just come back here, I'll mark an endpoint. What I'm going to do is hit V on the keyboard here. Now, of course, I'm hitting Control instead of Command. I'm just going to hit V on the keyboard to edit that in, push everything down, of course. We'll just hit T to mark the audio here. We're going to drop in our tone just like that. And what do we have now? Bars and tone to start our show off.
So you'll see what an important asset the audio tool is. Most people overlook it and they're only going to use their VU meters right here, but the audio tool is really an essential tool for a few things. One, it obviously gives you a very detailed look at your audio, but two, it also contains some very important commands like the ability to create tone media that you're going to need when working on your daily projects. So if you have any questions, you have any comments, or you have any tutorial requests, you can send them to Kevin P. McAuliffe at gmail.com. This has been Kevin P. McAuliffe. Thanks a lot for watching.